Hi, my name is Murray Cowell and I'd like to talk to you today about designing HTML emails that look great first time, every time, in every email client across any kind of device. Now, if you've ever tried to achieve that, you'll know that it's not as easy as it should be. I run an email marketing business called Belmont Mail. We help our clients to increase their sales, reduce their costs and make more profit using the medium of email as their primary marketing tool. We work with small and medium sized businesses, mostly in the southwest of the UK, but also across the whole of the south of England. Some of these businesses self manage using the dot mailer system because we're resellers of that system, so we can sell the exact same system that dot mailers blue chip clients use at a fraction of the cost. And some of our clients prefer a managed service, so they outsource their email campaigns to us and we run those campaigns on their behalf and provide advice and analysis to help them to get better results. I also have a website called Inbox Income, which I want to be the primary resource in the UK for anyone interested in getting better results from their email marketing. However, I'm not myself a designer or a developer because I use freelancers to do anything difficult. But when I first started Belmont Mail, I used to do a lot more hands-on stuff. So I discovered the hard way that getting HTML to look right in an email can be really difficult. It's so frustrating to design an email in Dreamweaver or another HTML editor, test it in a web browser and it looks fine. Maybe you send it to your own uh, Gmail account or a Hotmail or Webmail account and it all looks fine. And then you send it to Outlook and it falls apart. That's really annoying, especially if you know that the HTML is okay. You go back through your code looking for the mistake and you can't find it. Well, that's because the mistake isn't in your code. The mistake is in how Outlook renders HTML. Uh, and Outlook's not the only culprit, as we're going to see during this presentation, uh, because there are several other email clients that don't render HTML and CSS the way the web browsers do. And that's what makes it challenging to get emails to look the same in different email clients. And add to that uh, the growth in mobile devices, uh, and that's a further complication because what looks good on a desktop very often doesn't look at all good on a mobile device. Fortunately, I've discovered that if you follow a few simple guidelines, you can avoid the pain and frustration uh, of trying to sort all this out and have your emails looking great in all clients with the minimum of fuss. So, I'm not an expert on this subject, but I do have some experience and I've gathered together some of the principles to follow to get the most out of your email designs. Now, you may be very familiar with uh, HTML, or you may only know the basics, or maybe you don't know any HTML at all. Uh, I'm not an expert in HTML myself, although I do know a bit about it. Um, so, there may be a better way of doing things than uh, some of the suggestions that I'm going to make during this presentation. And if you know a better way, then please contact me, because I'd be really pleased to hear from you. I'm always interested in updating my own knowledge and the uh, resources that I'm putting on this website. Uh, if you don't know much HTML, don't worry because HTML for email is very basic and I'm going to explain it from the ground up. So for those of you who do know HTML, please bear with me. I'll keep those bits as brief as possible. On the other hand, I won't be explaining all the subtle nuances of how some of the coding requirements work. So for those of you who don't know HTML and never want to learn, those parts might be a little bit bewildering. Please bear in mind this presentation has been designed with a mixed audience in mind and I'm trying to cater for everybody. So, what are we going to be covering here today? First, we're going to look at the question, why email? We're going to explore whether or not we should be worried about email at all. Isn't social media taking over? Hasn't email had its day? Why are we bothered about email at all? And even if we accept that there's a role for email in marketing, why does it matter how emails are designed? Why don't we just use text-only emails? Next, I'll be uh, ranting on a bit about how Outlook is the whole problem here, which is not strictly true, but the vast majority of all the problems with HTML consistently are caused by Microsoft, so we'll be looking at why Outlook causes these problems and why Microsoft refuses to address the issue. Once I've got all that off my chest, we'll have a look at three key areas to ensure that your emails look beautiful. And those three areas are coding issues, image issues, and layout issues. These sections will include the do's and don'ts and the reasons why a particular approach is recommended. 
After exploring these general principles, we'll address the issue of video in emails very briefly, how to do it and how not to do it. We'll also have a look at how to design email for mobile devices, what the differences are and how to cater for both desktop and mobile in the same email. We'll touch on the subject of how to test your emails in different email clients and we'll also have a brief look at the pros and cons of using HTML editors. OK, so let's address the question, why email? Why are we bothering with email? Surely social media is such a game changer that email's a dead medium, isn't it? Certainly quite a few people are saying that it is. Well, let's have a look at some facts. In 2011, there were 3.5 billion email addresses, and that's predicted to rise in 2016 to 4 billion email addresses. That's a growth of 40% over the next four years, and email is 40 years old. It was uh, invented in 1971. Let's have a look at how email compares with social media. Every day there are 250 million tweets on Twitter, and that compares with a billion Facebook posts. But have a look at this, there are 294 billion emails sent every day, and that doesn't include spam. That's almost 300 emails for every Facebook post. So email dwarfs social media channels in terms of the volume of emails. But it's not just about volume, it's also about quality. So how do people rate the emails that they receive? The red column on this graph represents people who found less than 10% of their inbox interesting in 2010. And the blue column represents people who found more than 50% of their inbox interesting. But take a look at how these figures have changed by 2011. The volume of people who found less than 10% of their inbox to be interesting has dropped really dramatically. And at the same time, the volume of people who are finding more than 50% of their inbox interesting has risen. And that's a figure that should be of great importance to us as email marketers. Because if people are more interested in what they see in their inboxes, then they're more likely to open emails that we send to them. Look at how email marketing is growing. The number of people signed up to email marketing lists has grown by 12% year on year. Marketing email volumes have grown by 35%. And the open rates, that's the percentage of people who open the emails that they receive, has increased by 22%. All in all, the total amount of traffic that's being driven to websites from email marketing campaigns has risen year on year by 33%. In a survey of UK customers, 7% of people said that they followed at least one business on Twitter. 45% have liked at least one company on Facebook. But 94% of people are signed up to an email from at least one business. 84% of people are signed up to more than five emails. And 39% of people are signed up to more than 10. So this dispels the myth that people don't want to hear from businesses by email. These figures show that they do. In fact, when consumers were asked which channel they preferred for promotional messages, a whopping 77% of people said that email was their first choice. Facebook was right down in fourth place behind direct mail and SMS texting with 4%. And Twitter only managed 1%. You may be asking the question, what about the younger generation? Uh, because under 18s are notoriously disinterested in email? Well, the same set of questions was asked to a group of 15 to 17 year olds. And look at these results. Even in that group, the potentially the lowest users of email, 66% of people named email as their preferred channel for promotional messages. So even in groups that don't use email very much, it's still the preferred channel. In fact, looking at social media, Facebook, which has the highest market penetration of any social media channel, has still only achieved 58% of the UK population. And a third of UK consumers don't use any social media at all. Even amongst people who do use social media, two-thirds never share any promotional messages from businesses. So if businesses are relying too much on social media as a marketing medium, they could be ignoring a third of their market. So what's email got that social media hasn't? Well, it's got the MIME protocol, which is non-proprietary and universal. Nobody owns it, and anybody can use it. It's asynchronous, so people don't have to be online at the same time to use it. 
That's true for social media as well. But research suggests that people hang on to marketing emails and act on them at a later date, which maybe can't be said so much for promotional messages lost in a Facebook timeline. Email addresses are easy to segment and it's very easy to automate email marketing. This means that you can send direct, targeted, personalized messages to your clients, customers and prospects. And email marketing is easy to measure, which means that it's very straightforward to find out whether you're getting a return on your investment. Social media is notoriously difficult to measure. So in answer to the question, why email? Email is a universal, non-proprietary protocol. It's growing and it's going to continue to grow. It's the most fundamentally important tool for digital marketing. Who says so? Consumers of all ages who name email as their preferred channel for promotional messages. Consumer tolerance to well-designed emails is improving and that means that more people are signing up to email lists than ever before. They're opening more emails and the click-through rate is at a record high. So email marketing is not dying, it's booming. So why does design matter? Well, quite simply, HTML emails outperform text-only emails. Even within HTML emails, the template here on the left, which is rather pastely, was replaced by the template on the right, which is a little bit more vibrant and is better designed from a functional viewpoint. This slide shows the difference in results. The new template outperformed the previous template, driving almost twice as much traffic straight to the client's online shop. So, why is designing HTML emails problematic? Well, to answer that question, we need to look at a very short history of HTML. In the early days of HTML, websites were designed using tables. So this is an example that you can see here. The website logo at the top is held in one cell of the table. The top menu is a series of, in this case, five cells. And then there are three cells with a left-hand section a main content section and a right hand sidebar and then a cell all the way across the bottom for the footer. But this approach has certain limitations. It's very difficult to make changes. It requires a lot of recoding to do that because the whole table has to be redesigned to make any change. So cascading style sheets were invented to allow the separation between content and layout. So here's an example of a website that has been designed using a cascading style sheet and using this tool we can explore um, and see that all the information concerning where this particular element of the page is positioned is held in the style sheet. So for example it's floated to the left and if we were to change that to float it to the right you can see that the element moves over to the right. So one of the benefits of CSS is that it makes it very easy to make um, changes to the layout without having to go into the main HTML document. So uh, to give you another example I can change the margin here and you can see that the margin to the right of that element increases. It also allows whole classes to be defined so for example the color of the the text is held in the body tag of the style sheet and so you can see that if I make a change to that several other areas on the page have changed and that's because they're also affected by the same piece of CSS. This is the style sheet in its entirety and what this contains is all the information that controls the layout of every area and every element on the website. So CSS was introduced to put content and layout in separate files but browser support for style sheets was very slow and it wasn't until the mid 2000s that all browsers universally supported it. Email clients have been even slower to adopt, notably Microsoft Outlook. To illustrate this situation, let's build a newsletter. Well, to save us the trouble, here's one that I made earlier. Uh, fairly basic sort of layout. And this is built using HTML and CSS. So this is the HTML file and you can see that uh, there are various divisions that have been defined and all the information about where those divisions should be positioned are contained in this style sheet. Now, standards for HTML are set and monitored by the W3C organization. 
So let's just have a look at our HTML here and check that that's valid. And yep, that document has been successfully checked by the W3C service and certified as being valid. Let's try the same for the CSS. Okay, so that's showing us that we've got valid HTML and valid CSS. So let's have a go at sending that to Outlook and see what the result is like. And once again, to save time, I've already done that. So this is the result when you send that HTML to Outlook. Oh dear. That's not what we wanted at all, is it? And it looks absolutely dreadful. Um, at the end of an Outlook email, if you right click, you can pick, you can select view source and it'll show you the HTML that's being used. And this will, this will show us the root of the problem because if we look at our HTML, we had a line in there, this line here, that says that what that uh, piece of code does is it tells you an HTML file where to find the style sheet for the template. And if we go back and look at our source code here, we can find that in the header section of the HTML, where that's supposed to be, that line has been taken out. So Outlook strips out all references to an external style sheet. And it's not the only email client that does that. Most email clients do. Okay, but fortunately, HTML provides us with another option, and here it is. This is the style tag, because rather than having this external style sheet, you can put your CSS between style tags and incorporate it within the document with the HTML. So let's just check that against the W3C service to make sure that it's still valid code. Revalidate it. And it is, so it's passed, it's been checked as um, valid HTML and CSS. Let's have a look at what happens when you send that to Outlook. Okay, so that's a little bit better. You can see that some of the styles have been applied, but it's still a very long way off the look that we're trying to get. Let's have a look at the source code, see what that tells us. And this is very interesting because you can see that our style tags are still there and all the CSS that we defined has been preserved. So now it's not that the CSS isn't there, it's just that Outlook doesn't render it properly. And that's the problem. Why does Outlook do this? Well, uh, the reason is that before 2007, Outlook used Internet Explorer to render HTML. But from 2007 onwards, Outlook began to use Word to render HTML. And the HTML rendering engine in Word works very differently to how HTML works in browsers. And it isn't standards compliant. Everybody hoped that in 2010, Microsoft would take the opportunity to change the situation. They didn't, and it also looks like Office 2013, when it comes out next year, five years on, will still be using Word as the rendering engine, and there are still no signs of any standards compliance. Why does this matter? Well, Outlook's market share is about 28%, higher than that of any other single email client. And in business-to-business -business markets, it may be even higher. This is an analysis of the last email that uh, I sent and you can see from this that almost two-thirds of my clients and prospects are using Outlook to read their emails and in the breakdown that shows that 26.5% of my audience using 2003 or below and the rest of them are using later versions of Outlook so you can be pretty sure that if I don't get my emails looking right in Outlook then that's going to affect quite a significant minority of my clients and it's probably true for everybody. So what did Microsoft got to say about the issue? Well this quote from their product manager is very interesting indeed because he seems to be saying that the reason that Microsoft are persisting with this situation is so that people can use smart art, automatic styles and templates. His second 
sentence is very interesting because he seems to be saying that Microsoft don't really care about standards compliance within email. And when he was asked why Word has to be used to render emails as well as write them, his reply is really saying it's so that one Outlook user can read the HTML emails that have been written by another Outlook user. The bottom line is that Microsoft are well aware of the situation, they're unrepentant, and there's no sign of this situation changing anytime soon. It will be years, if ever, before there are standards compliance browsers, and longer still before everybody's using them. But Outlook is not the only culprit here. This spreadsheet shows compliance across many different clients for various different aspects of CSS support. And you can see that at best support for CSS across clients is patchy and the situation is a long way off there being any kind of standard. So it looks like this is a situation that we're going to have to live with and work with for some time to come. So what to do? Well here are some guidelines for coding emails. Firstly no style sheets, no external style sheets because most email clients won't link to them. So all CSS must be in line. You can use style tags, but bear in mind that many email clients will strip them out. Use CSS for styling, but not for layout. Some clients will strip out the style tags, other clients may use them. And actually that can be quite useful because that's what we're going to use to get our mobile devices to uh, render emails differently to desktops, which we'll be coming on to a little bit later on. So uh, all CSS should be in line. Um, HTML provides the facility to put CSS in line. So this uh, example here is a paragraph tag which has style equals and in quotes color hash 4f's and two zeros. This example is a paragraph tag which has inserted in it some inline CSS, a style statement with a color and uh, a he the hex code for that particular color. So this is what's called inline CSS. The float CSS attribute is not well supported, so don't use it. Use tables for layout instead. And on the right here, I've shown the basic structure of a four cell, very simple two row, four cell table. Div tags are okay for styling, but they may break in some clients if you use them for layout. So avoid using um, divs for layout. Center your email using a centering table, not CSS. So what's shown here is the code for two tables, one of which is nested inside the other. The first table has a width of 99%. Uh, there is an email client that has a bug that means that it won't uh, render properly if it's 100%. So make it 99%. Uh, the inner table has got a width of 600 pixels defined uh, and is aligned center. And also the cell in which that table is contained by the container table is also aligned to the center. And this will reliably uh, center your uh, email content in most email clients, if not all of them, without any CSS at all. Background images. Outlook doesn't support background images, but some clients do. So if you're using them, bear in mind that uh, some of your audience won't be able to see them. And make sure that the email looks good without the background image as well as with the background image. Background color is inconsistent on nested tables, so make sure that it's redefined for every cell or every table at least. The at font face attribute is not supported well in email clients, so use web safe fonts or use images if you want to use an unusual font. The border radius attribute is fairly unreliable, so instead use images with rounded corners. And this is a demonstration of that here, where the, uh, this is a six cell table where the top right hand and bottom right hand cells contain images with rounded corners, and the middle right hand cell has a background color, the same color as those images. Margins and padding are also implemented differently in different clients, so use nested tables and cell padding as well, they're, they're more reliable. And it's also more reliable to use nested tables than it is to use the call span uh, HTML attribute. Cell padding and cell spacing, not all clients automatically read these as zero, so it's best to zero them in all tables. And this piece of code here shows how you do that. You just put cell spacing equals zero, cell padding equals zero in every declaration of a table. Line height tends to work at block level only. A lot of clients ignore it. 
uh, at line level. So, for example, putting it in a div tag is okay, putting it in a span tag most likely won't work. Bullet points are also not always supported, so this is a piece of code that you can use instead to create a text bullet point. If you're pasting any content from Word, Word has a lot of um, additional code in it that's only relevant to Word, so save it as a text document first and then recopy it and paste it as a way of removing all that code. No JavaScript or any other scripts, no form tags, uh, anything that requires any kind of um, interaction probably won't work in most clients and it may trigger spam filters and security warnings in some other clients. Okay, well that's uh, it for coding issues, so let's move on to image issues. 33% of people have images switched off by default and many email clients default to images switched off. The reason for this is that the images are usually stored on a remote server. So when the images are downloaded, it makes a call to the server, which can be used to confirm that your email address is a valid one. So it's a, a common uh, trick used by spammers to validate email addresses. So images are switched off by default as a security measure. It's important, therefore, to check how your email looks without images to make sure uh, that it's going to look OK. So looking at, looking at our example email here, this is how it appears in Outlook with the images switched off. Uh, and you can still see the key message of the email. It doesn't look as good as it does with the images um, downloaded, but it is still legible. You can use the alt text to tempt people to turn images on. So here's an example of that where um, a, a very plain beige background has been used. And the alt text says, please download the images to view this email. Here's another example. This says, can't cook, won't cook, neither will my hair. And down here, it says, when things get hot, a little Aussie will protect you way better than a strapping fireman ever could. You've got to admit, that makes you at least a little bit curious as to what the images are. And when you switch them on, the whole email makes a lot more sense. And as you can see, it looks a lot better with the images turned on. This is another option. Uh, this email consists of a large image on the right, but they, they've put the, the content of the email down the left-hand side, so you can still see what the email's about, and there may be enough in the content on the left to make you want to switch images on. This is an example of how not to do it. They've used alt text that says things like logo, spacer, telephone, email, nav, online, shop. So there's really not very much there to encourage you to turn the images on. Optimize your images, so make sure that they're the same size as they will be in the email. Uh, and if you're saving from Photoshop, use Progressive Scan or Interleaved to reduce the uh, image size uh, and also to make the, uh, the images load more attractively. Don't embed images in the email. The email will be too big. It may trigger spam filters and the load times will be too great. So always host remotely and use the full path. So this uh, piece of code has got HTTP www.belmont.uk.com, which is the address of the server as well as the location of the, of the image. Include the image dimensions. This preserves the layout while the images are loading to make sure that your email looks good. And include both the HTML attribute and a CSS style attribute, so that if one is ignored, the other one will be picked up. This is what happens if you don't do that. So this is um, an email where the image uh, has the size of the image hasn't been defined, uh, and so an email with the title of "Things to Remember" okay, then appears to be completely void of any. Preview pane. Some browsers put white gaps around all images. You can stop this using the the style uh, declaration display block. This is a, an example of what happens if you don't do that. So an email here that would otherwise uh, have looked pretty good is ruined by the introduction of all these white gaps. This is that same email with images switched off, by the way. If you receive that in your inbox, why would you do anything other than immediately delete it? Animated GIFs work in some clients, but not others. So what would otherwise have been quite a clever piece of animation in some clients will just, in this example, appear as just a blue square or a green square, depending on your own internal colour balance. And beware of high image to text ratios. This may trigger some spam filters. Okay, let's have a look at some other layout issues then. Preview panes. 
Many email clients use a preview pane, so it's quite important to make sure that your key message can be seen even in the preview pane. What can the users see that might encourage them to open your email and read it? Also bear in mind that in some clients, so Outlook for example, the user has the opportunity to put the uh, reading pane on the right. Um, so once again, make sure that your key messages are visible uh, on the left hand side. It's also good practice to place your unsubscribe link quite near the top of your email. The reason for that is if people can't find the unsubscribe link, many email clients have a report as spam button. So if people can't find your unsubscribe link, they'll simply report your email as spam. So your spam reports will go up if people can't find your link. Make sure that your calls to action are clear and bold and if you have image buttons make sure that you double up with a text link so that people can see what they have to do even if they have images switched off and make sure that there are plenty of links especially if there's a lot of scrolling involved use anchor text and back to top links to navigate around long emails so this is an example of that the blue section at the top is the in this issue and each item in this issue has a link further down the email uh, and each story in the longer part of the email has a back to top link that takes people back up to the index. Many third party email services have a facility to send a plain text version of the email as well as an HTML version and this is so people who are receiving the email on a device that doesn't support HTML can still read it. You can format these plain text versions separately from the formatting of your HTML version. So it's a good idea to check the layout and make sure that it's going to be legible on what will most likely be a small mobile device in plain text. So for example you might make shorter paragraphs, you might use uh, text symbols to uh, highlight headlines and to make a separation from one part of the email to another and remember to change image links into text only links. It's a good idea to make your email 600 pixels wide. This allows for a navigation pane to the left and uh, a standard sort of 1024 by 768 screen resolution. And avoid putting a big image in the header because when that's seen in a preview pane with the images off, uh, there'll be nothing there to entice your uh, audience to open the email and read it. And be careful with custom line breaks because some email clients will change the font size and may display them differently so your custom line breaks may not appear where you intended them to. It's far better to put the text inside a table because then it will be automatically will um, stay the width of that table whatever the size of the font. Okay looking at video in email most clients won't play embedded video so steer clear of any services that offer the opportunity to embed videos in your emails. They probably won't work and they might even throw up a security violation in some clients. It's much better to use the image of a frame and link to a video that's either hosted on your website or on YouTube. Okay let's move on to look at the subject of designing for mobile. This is important because as this graph shows the proportion of people opening emails on mobile is continuing to increase and is increasing quite dramatically and, uh, it's, and is decreasing at the same rate on desktops. This is probably especially true if you're in a business to consumer market. In business to business markets, this is going back to the analysis of my last email, you can see that 11% of people opened it on an iPhone and about 0.5% of people opened it on an Android device so in my business to business market it's significantly lower but the trend is rising and it's rising fast so uh, making sure that your email renders properly in mobile is really important. Some of the design tips to keep in mind uh, most many mobile devices have a screen width of 480 pixels so single column layouts work best make sure that your key message and your call to action are near the top. Uh, minimize the amount of scrolling that people have to do so it makes sense to create a different version of your email that's much shorter. And you can use the attribute display none to hide elements in the mobile version and I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. 
Apple recommend that all links should be a minimum size of 44 pixels by 44 pixels and the iPhone has a minimum font size of 13 pixels so if you make any fonts smaller than that the iPhone will resize them. The at media query um, allows CSS to be designed for specific devices so this piece of CSS here has at media only screen and max device width 480 pixels. So what that means is that the CSS that follows immediately after that will only apply to devices that are showing the email on a screen and have a maximum device width of 480 pixels. And that means that in this case the table can be um, defined with a width of 320 pixels whereas for all other devices it will appear with a width of 640 pixels. How that works in action, this is an example that shows two tables nested inside a containing table. The containing table is 640 pixels wide and the two smaller tables are 320 pixels. The first of those two tables is aligned to the left so the second one will flow to the right of it if the table is 640 wide. At the top of the page here the at media query sets the table width to 320 pixels for devices with a display of less than 480 pixels wide. So if it's viewed on a desktop this email will show the two tables side by side but if it's viewed on a mobile device with a narrow screen the tables will be one above the other. Other things that you can do with responsive layouts you can set up show hide buttons that allow headings to be expanded and you can also get smaller header images to display on a mobile device to allow more space for your key message. It's possible to use percentage statements and maximum and minimum width instead of fixed width for flexible layouts. So this image that's being defined here will expand and contract to 90% of the screen width. So as the screen width changes, so will the size of the image. Here's a good example of that, this Starbucks newsletter. As I shrink the size, the width of the screen, you can see the newsletter is automatically rendering itself into a different layout, more appropriate to the width of the screen. So if I get it as to the width of a mobile device, you can see that it's automatically adjusted to be the size of a mobile layout. Whereas if it's larger, it expands automatically. Testing. When testing the look of your emails, Dreamweaver has an Outlook plugin which allows you to pick up all the CSS properties that Outlook won't display before you finish designing your email. There are various inbox previewers available. Probably the best one is Email on Acid. It's very cheap to sign up and this will allow you to submit your HTML and receive back a screenshot of how your email is going to look on as many different devices as you want to choose. If you want to do quick and dirty testing, then if your email looks good in Outlook, Webmail, either your Android or your iPhone, and uh, Gmail, Yahoo or Hotmail, it's probably going to look pretty good everywhere. Uh, but re do remember to test your plain text version as well. And if you want to test for spam, there are numerous free online spam testers that will uh, measure how the content of your uh, email measures up against various um, spam filters. HTML editors, editors and other tools that are available. Um, there's Dreamweaver, of course, but do be careful uh, if you're using the drag and drop uh, functionality of Dreamweaver, it sometimes inserts bits of CSS and changes width statements uh, without you asking it to. Uh, there's a great service called Premailer um, which allows you to input your uh, CSS and HTML uh, with the CSS between style tags and changes all of that into inline CSS. So uh, that's a great uh, time saver because it saves you having to code every line individually. And then there are third party platforms such as uh, the Dot Mailer or Belmont Mail um, platform. This is the Belmont Mail system powered by Dot Mailer. It's a drag and drop system so you don't need any technical or coding skills to use it. On the left here we have various elements that you can simply drag and drop into your newsletter, text boxes, 
uh, image boxes. There are column layouts, spaces, um, whoops, spaces so you can uh, add white space to the layout of your email. And there's even an RSS feed here so that you can get the content for the email from an RSS feed and a social sharing tool that once again you can just drag and drop into your email allowing you to share with social media. Once in the uh, email, changing the layout simple, these pink highlights indicate drop zones where the elements can be placed. So any elements can be picked up and moved from one drop zone to another. The elements can be duplicated very easily. And moved or to a different drop, when you move them to a different drop zone, they're automatically resized. There we go. And they're deleted simply by clicking this red cross in the corner of the element. The image manager automatically optimizes the images and resizes them to the drop zone that you drop them in. Changing column widths is as simple as dragging and dropping the edge of the column and images resize automatically or you can use this tool in the corner to change the size and these images are being resampled on the fly so that when the email is sent they'll automatically be optimized to exactly the right size. There are all sorts of uh, formatting options available for text so you've got different font types, different font sizes, colors and the colour selection tool here also retains all the colours that are already in use in, in the template. So it makes it very easy to get matching colours in the template. Then you've got bold and italic, underline, strike through, superscript, subscript and all the usual text justification options, numbered and unnumbered lists. You can use tables. And if you're familiar with the HTML, you can adjust the HTML of either a single element by clicking this button here. Or you can click this button up here to get the HTML for the whole template. You can also style the, the, the other colour scheme in the template using this tab here. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to select the background colour here. And this colour picker appears, which allows me to very easily change the colour of the background to whatever colour I want it to be. You can also use the hex number if you know it. Another option that's available is adding borders and padding to individual elements. So I can add the borders and padding here. So there's really quite a lot of options for styling the email without needing any technical skills whatsoever. This is the easiest to use HTML editor that I've ever come across. And the templates that it produces are unbreakable. They work first time, every time, in every email client. If you're interested in a more thorough demo, then please get in touch at www.belmont.uk.com and I can set you up with a trial account so you can try this out for yourself and see for yourself how easy it is to use this system without needing any technical skills at all. Well that brings us to the end of this presentation. I hope that you've enjoyed it and I hope that you found it useful. Uh, please let me know what you thought. I'm always interested in your comments and feedback and do make sure that you bookmark the Inbox Income website because we're going to be adding more and more content, uh, hints and tips and advice about how to get the most from your email marketing campaigns over the coming weeks and months. If you'd like to be kept informed about when a new piece of content has been added, then use the sign up form on this page to add yourself to the email list and we'll send you an email every time we add a, a new topic. In the meantime, thanks very much for your kind attention and all the best with your email campaigns.